So back in 2001, what we call here in post-apocalyptic 2020, the before times, the BBC and the Discovery Channel teamed up for their Son of God documentary to reconstruct what Jesus might have actually looked like. Obviously, we don't have any photos or even really any contemporaneous descriptions of his appearance from antiquity. All we really have here are some later accounts that said he was just kind of short and let's just say people didn't end up following him for his good looks, but that's it. That's all we have in terms of ancient texts. So this study used a bunch of advanced forensic techniques. They analyzed skulls from first century Palestine. They analyzed artwork from the third century that depicted Middle Eastern Jewish people like Jesus. They gave him short hair and a beard, which was the accepted hairstyle at the time. Paul actually even comments on this in 1 Corinthians where he says that it's disgraceful for men to have long hair. Hours and hours of research, multiple experts weighing in, and all for a relatively realistic glimpse at what Jesus might have looked like. But anyway, they came up with this. What is this? <laughs> That's obviously not what they came up with. They actually came up with this. And yeah, all of this is really impressive. Just the amount of time and effort and research that they put into this, it just begs the question, how did Jesus go from being a brown-skinned Middle Eastern man to bearded Ryan Reynolds? Actually, not mad at that image. <laughs> Why is this the image that a lot of us grew up with? Why is this the one that we see in a lot of our churches? Basically, I just wanna know how Jesus became white. Okay, so you might remember this iconic moment from Megyn Kelly a few years back. Just because it makes you feel uncomfortable doesn't mean it has to change. You know, I mean, Jesus yeah. was a white man too. Jesus was a white man too. And you know, it's really not surprising that someone would think that Jesus was white when they grew up only seeing pictures of white Jesus. But this is how we revise our own history. We just start pretending that actual history matches what we think it should have been. And eventually, people just start accepting it as fact. And we see this all over the place. It happens more often than you'd think. It happened in antiquity. There was mythologization of significant figures like Alexander the Great that started to pop up in less than a single generation. It even happened with significant figures in American history like George Washington or Alexander Hamilton. Like startlingly soon after the careers of these people, the rough parts of their stories get sanded down or omitted entirely. Little stories are added here and there so that they make for better or more moralistic stories to teach kids about. They become more heroic or villainous, which the story calls for, more central to the story and less controversial overall. And eventually what you have is a mythology of a person or movement instead of a history. How do you just revise it, you know, in the middle of the legacy of the story? Yeah, that's how. But why do we do this? Well, we do it for a number of reasons, but a big one is so that we don't really have to deal with the difficult realities of our own history. Like, it's still not uncommon even today to hear people talk about the history of enslaved people in America in these weird, romanticized terms. You'll hear about how so many slaves were happy to work in the fields, how their lives were actually better than they would have been if they hadn't been, um, immigrated to the U.S.? And yeah, all that is terrible. It's absolutely wrong, but you can see how it might make someone feel better about their ancestors or about their country to make a few tweaks to the historical record. We wanna live in a world where we see ourselves as the good guys, as the heroes. We want history to reflect that image back to us. But even today, it's still happening. Like just last month, white people on Twitter were trying to white explain to Martin Luther King III what Dr. King actually meant when he said, a riot is the language of the unheard. By saying things like, uh, technically he acknowledged that, but that's not how he acted, and that's certainly not how he succeeded. That quote is taken completely out of context. The great MLK would never condone any kind of activity like that. Your father was a brilliant man, but he wouldn't condone the riots. He thought there was a better way to deal with the issues. Your father led many protests. He was arguably the most successful civil rights leader of all time, and he never once rioted. But let that sink in. Randos on Twitter are like, 
MLK3 doesn't really know what his own father meant or stood for, so I, a completely random white person and one dog, need to explain that to him. Again, about his own father. Like, how do you even get to that mental state to do something like that? But actually, Dr. King is a really interesting case here. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't made white like white Jesus, but he was sort of baptized into whiteness by people changing and sort of messing around with what he stood for until his message was non-threatening enough and non-controversial enough for white people to adopt this mythological version of him as one of their own. But can we just take a second to see how this idea is used, how it functions in our modern discourse? Like if we believe in a version of history where Dr. King solved racism once and for all and he did it without significantly challenging challenging any of our deeply held beliefs about ourselves, then that means that we don't have to deal with racism. We can deny that it exists, or if it does exist, then it's just overblown or not a big deal or whatever. And it's actually really hard to set the record straight after this kind of thing happens. Part of the mythology that people create is that this is actually how it's always been. Like it's retroactively true and the people trying to actually correct the record are accused of ironically rewriting history, but we can start to see how altering our ideas about the past aren't really even about the past. It's more about maintaining a present that's comfortable for the dominant culture. So in a lot of ways, the mythology of white MLK functions exactly the same way as the mythology of white Jesus. It only took a few hundred years after Jesus' death to start seeing depictions of white Jesus. And this was largely due to a huge historical development that would change Christianity forever. And that was the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine to Christianity in the early fourth century. And when this happened, there were some pretty big theological issues, we'll say, that needed to be dealt with. Like all that stuff that Jesus talked about that wasn't compatible with a huge empire that conquered and pillaged and whatnot had to be reinterpreted. You kind of have to deal with stuff like blessed are the peacemakers when your empire is starting wars of expansion all the time or blessed are the meek when you're literally the most powerful man on the planet. And so Christianity had to change to accommodate this. And part of that was making Jesus a proper, obedient, model Roman citizen and white. They needed a Jesus that would approve of domination and imperial power. None of this first shall be last stuff. The first shall be first and the first shall be us. But this view of Jesus would continue through the medieval period into the modern period of European history. And with most European monarchs identifying as Christians, there would need to be a mythology of Christ that would be continually updated to suit the needs of powerful people. And so Jesus wasn't just okay with empire, but he was rewritten to be okay with colonialism and everything that came with that. And this is where Jesus' whiteness became much more of a necessity. Whiteness, not really like the skin color or anything, but the sociological construct of whiteness was created to justify a hierarchy of people in the world. And this really isn't a big secret. European writers wrote about this extensively and explicitly. Ibram X. Kendi writes about this exact thing in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, when he notes, in 1606, the same diplomat who brought the addictive tobacco plant to France formally defined race for the first time in a major European dictionary. Race means descent. Jean Nicot wrote in, insert French title here, therefore it is said that a man, a horse, a dog, or another animal is from a good or bad race. From the beginning, to make races was to make racial hierarchy. He goes on to say that they grouped all those peoples from Africa into a single race for that very reason, to create hierarchy, the first racist idea. Race making is an essential ingredient in the making of racist ideas. But when it comes down to it, if you want to create a worldwide colonial empire, you're going to have to destroy a lot of human lives. That's just the way it is. And they slept by telling themselves that the lives they were destroying were somehow less, that they didn't matter. So more often than not, the justification for all of this was the idea of whiteness, the idea that God favors white people, the idea that the world is as it should be when white people are on top and that anyone else just kind of exists to serve in some way. White supremacy was not an accident. It was invented to solve a moral problem. How can we colonize, kill, steal, etc., and not feel bad about it? 
Jesus would continue to be altered and changed as he made his way across the Atlantic to the US. Jesus was used to support white supremacy through the Civil War era, through the Civil Rights Movement, up to today. And so, yeah, after all that, that's why I think white Jesus is a problem. It's not just that it's rewriting history, it's that it's rewriting history so that it's easier to accept all the inequity and injustice in the world. Making Jesus white isn't a neutral decision. It's a politically charged statement about who should be on top. Jesus' whiteness was wielded as a weapon against people of color for centuries. And so I think it's finally time for us to find our way back to a more authentic Jesus. But I still hear some of you saying, does Jesus' actual race matter? Can't we all just picture Jesus how we want? Can't we just picture him in a way that's familiar to us? Okay. Maybe, but whiteness isn't just the default, and it's simply wrong to say that race doesn't matter, and that idea is really only something that white people have the privilege of believing. The rest of us know that race does matter. We don't have the luxury of ignoring it. It matters a lot to people because it's been the basis of oppression and violence for millennia. But just ask yourself, why would you choose for Jesus to be white? Why is that something that you feel like you need? And to answer that this is just how it's always been isn't gonna cut it anymore. The just don't worry about it approach to race simply isn't working. It's something that we need to think hard about and have deep constructive conversations on. Ultimately, it's a relatively small change to let go of Jesus' whiteness. Like, I, I don't think that white Jesus causes racism. It's not this huge flashpoint in American culture. It's more of a symptom of racism than anything else. But I think that you'll see that once you do let go of that image, you'll start to see the world just a little bit differently. And you'll start to see that white Jesus was always just that, an image. It was an idol. It was something that made it easier for people to worship themselves, to worship wealth and power, rather than the real Jesus. One of the saddest things about white Jesus is how much more weak and ineffective he is compared to the real thing. When I think about the real Jesus, I think about the Jesus that came to liberate the oppressed. I think about the Jesus who envisioned a kingdom that wasn't based on domination or hierarchy. It was the kingdom where somehow the last would be first, where the meek would inherit the earth and where the least of these are treasured and cared for. But I'm reminded that Jesus really didn't have a privileged background. He was poor, his family struggled, he often found himself in conflict with the local authorities. In fact, black 20th century theologians saw these parallels between Jesus' experiences and their own. Martin Luther King himself actually was a proponent of this idea called the Black Christ. It wasn't really a statement about Jesus' actual ancestry or his skin color, but it was actually about Jesus' shared experience of struggle against unjust authorities. But I think that's where there's still hope. There's so much misinformation and cultural baggage piled on top of Jesus, but he's still there for us to discover. The authentic Jesus, the one that challenges white supremacy, the one whose vision of a kingdom of God is so antithetical to a culture of domination and subjugation, a culture where might makes right. But Jesus himself rather preached a message of love and justice, the kind of love that can't coexist with racial or social hierarchies. It's the kind of love that actually moves us towards action, that moves us towards justice. So my hope is that we can pray this prayer confidently to the authentic Jesus, the friend of the oppressed and the downtrodden. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me the real thing. I want the real Is it, 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 is it,
guys, thank you so much for watching this episode and hanging with us this week. This was actually a really important episode to Jordan and I. Like writing this and preparing this was good and healing for my heart um, to hear about this Jesus. So if this resonated with you, please share it with your family, with your friends, with your church. We'd love to see how you all respond to this message. And feel free to comment down in the comment section. We'd love to chat with you guys. But that's it from me. Feel free to subscribe if you enjoyed it. Hit the bell button to be notified when we upload. We usually upload on Sundays. But yeah, thank you guys again. We love you and we'll see you next time. Bye.